You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Manchester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We've been looking at some of the obstacles or barriers between going over to reach, help, and build with others. And in week two, we looked at um, the, the posture or the attitude of your heart and how that needs to be a certain way in order to facilitate us going over, crossing over. Last week, we talked about the fact that Sam, the Samaritan, had oil and bandages in his bag because he had been down the same road before we, we proposed and he had his own pain and we talked about scars and it was a powerful morning. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna get practical. Is that okay? We're gonna do quick fire, just like three, four minutes per step and I'll explain why they're steps in a moment. But just to sort of anchor it and get us in this kind of zone. Today's message is called, why did the Christian cross the road to go on a journey? To go on a journey. In actual fact, this challenge that Pastor Glynn brilliantly sort of visualized for us a couple of weeks ago about the 12 feet of going over the road and how much power there is in just, just that 12 feet of crossing over. I'm here to tell you today that that's just the start. When Sam the Samaritan crossed over the road, it wasn't that he was crossing the finish line, he was actually crossing the start line. Let me read the verses to you, or the verse to you in verse 34. It says, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and we looked at that last week. And then it says this, then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. In the Living Bible, a different translation, it puts it this way. Make sure you're focusing on these words. It says, he put the man on his own donkey and walked along beside him until they came to an inn and nursed him through the night. This message is about how we can actually do just that. Once we've crossed over the road, we've got over our sort of insecurity or our fear or whatever it is, we've, we've kind of, we've got some healing from God, we've actually crossed over. How do you actually then walk with, the Bible says about Sam that he walked alongside the man on his donkey until he got to an inn. And we're gonna get practical, is that okay? We're gonna go six steps, just a couple of minutes on each one, and these are not linear steps. The order that we deliver them to you does not mean that they're the order you have to do them in, but each of these steps are part of the journey that we have committed as a church to go on when we actually do it and cross over the road. And we've been praying for our friends and our, and our neighbors and things like that for the last few weeks, and you've got people in your heart put there by God that you've been praying for, and maybe you've had some nervous conversations or you've had a couple of opportunities and you thought God was, that th this was the moment. Well, now we're gonna get practical, okay? So the first step on how do we, um, steps in the journey, I better say what's on the slide, otherwise it won't line up. Steps in the journey of reaching, helping, and building with others is always gonna do the first one. Hello. I don't often get chance to do this, so this is quite exciting. Okay, so the first step, they're not in any order, but the, my step, what I'm gonna share with you is to create space, okay? We need to create space. When, when you walk with people, it is never gonna be convenient. The Good Samaritan, he must have been on his way somewhere. He must have been in a rush. Well, he must have had a time he needed to be somewhere. But he didn't think about that when he saw someone who needed help. He probably, really, in his diary, in his calendar, he probably didn't have time to stop. He probably didn't have time to help this man, but that wasn't in his thinking, okay? He stopped to help him. And when he helped him, he didn't rush. He took his time. He spent time with the man. 
He cleaned his wounds and then he walked with him and it says that he nursed him through the night. And, and he made sure that the man was safe before he left him, okay? So it can't have been convenient for the Samaritan. So for us, it's not going to be convenient, okay? Um, I've got a little story for you about something that happened to me. As some of you might know, I, I am a runner, okay? I, I do running. I recently did the Manchester Marathon. <laughs> and it was really hard, but I loved it. It was... Three it hours, was... 30 minutes, people. Three hours, 30 minutes. <laughs> and... and and when I was driving in here today, I was so nervous to come and do this. I thought, oh, I think I'd rather be running the marathon today than doing this. But anyway, getting back to my story, I'm, I'm a runner, right? And so every day I will go out and I will run. And I set my watch when I set off and it's time in me. And if you know me, I'm not a very competitive person at all. When we're playing games, I really don't care if I win or lose. But when I'm running, I really like to do it faster than I did it yesterday or faster than somebody else I know has done a similar run. So I, I <laughs> but that's the only time I'm competitive. So I really don't like anybody to stop me when I'm running, right? I, it, I do find it really annoying and really inconvenient. So if I see somebody I know, which I do quite a lot, I pretend I've not seen them <laughs> or... I just wave like that. I often run past my old neighbour that I had as a child and he, he's a lovely man, he was brilliant. So I, he knows that I'm not going to talk to him. So I do just wave. So one day when I was running, there's a hill. I'd not long, I'd not long left to go, I was nearly home. But there's a hill um, and it, it's, it's quite a busy road and I have to run across this hill and it's called Garstang Avenue, right? And this is probably quite similar to the road that the, pro that, um, the Samaritan was on. It's, it's not a very nice road. You, you could possibly get robbed when you're on this road. So um, I was running across this road, but there was a lady on um, a mobility scooter and she seemed to be stuck in the, like, the gutter, right? And she was motioning me to her. I think she was like talking to me, but I couldn't hear because I was listening to someone preaching. Um, but I could see she was motioning. I just thought, oh no. So I had to stop running, go over to this lady and she wanted me to push her up the hill out of the gutter. And, and so I did, I did it. And I was so frustrated at having to do it. But I think if I hadn't have done it, she'd still be in the gutter trying to get, and it's a really steep hill. So it wasn't easy to get her going and get her up this hill till she was off ready and I'm holding my thumbs up and, and she was all right. But I'm telling you this story, right? Because sometimes, even when we're doing something that's really important to us, we might have to stop. We might have to stop, pause, and just give somebody else the time and the space that we need. We may need to pause and walk with someone and just put on hold what we're doing, okay? Um, so there's a couple of really practical tips I want to give you this morning to just help with this. A thing that you can do is leave some margin in your diary. Have a little bit of space, a little bit of breathing space in your diary where you can just put help someone or, or walk time or something like that where you can just give somebody some time to walk with because it's really, really important. You're never going to have enough time. You always, well, you can't always plan for these things. Sometimes you have to stop what you're doing and just help like, like I did with the lady. Sometimes you might have to just do things like that and it is inconvenient. Don't expect it to be convenient. It, it isn't gonna be something that's convenient. You're never gonna have enough time. People are really, really important to God and they need to be really, really important to, to us. People are super, super important, okay? Um, we, we need each other. We need each other to help. We need each other to walk on side, alongside each other. God has created us to be in relationships. And like I say, relationships are never going to be convenient. It's always going to be difficult. 
And I really think that together, when we do this life together, we're happier. I, I personally, I've never been to Rwanda, but I know there's so many people here that have been to Rwanda. And we've seen the, the videos that they bring back, showing the children, the adults, everyone's faces in Rwanda. And I don't know about you, but they look really, really happy. And to me, they seem really, really happy. And I really believe this is because they live so close in community together. They need each other. They, they do everything together. But us, we tend to do things on our own, like I'll go doing the food shopping on my own. But if I really thought about it, I could take someone with me and spend time with someone as I do something that I need to do. Um, but in, so in Rwanda, like even the ladies, they don't go and collect the water on their own. There's a huge group from the community and they all go together and they go and collect the water together. So I really think that this is something that um, is, makes them happier because we're better together. James 3 in the message, um, verses 17 to 18 says, real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with other, others. It is gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings, not hot one day and cold the next, not two-faced. You, you can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. Relationships can feel like hard work, but it's worth it. The hard work is worth it. And can I just speak to you in here who may be an introvert? You may think, I don't need people. I'm an introvert, and sometimes I think I can do things on my own, but I really can't. And it's taken me a long time to realize that I do need people. So even you introverts, when God created you as an introvert, he also created you to need people. So he knew that you would need each other. Even if you think, you don't. Even if I think, I, I don't need other people. God created me as an introvert, but also with a need for other people, with a need for community. Um, and sometimes, as an introvert, it's not comfortable to go and try and make relationships and friendships, but you've got to go beyond what feels comfortable. Sometimes it's good to be uncomfortable, okay? And I really do believe that when you share your life with others, you will be happier. There's real power in relationships. You find healing. Um, in that verse, in a verse in the Bible, it talks about confess your sins um, to God and he will forgive you. But when you share than with other people, you will find healing. So I really believe that with other people, God will bring healing to your life through your relationships. Um, Ecclesiastes 4.9 says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Relationships are good. Do life together. Wonderful. All right. So step number one, make sure you write it down, create some space, create some space. Another step is go beyond the surface, go beyond the surface. This verse is not in the slides, forgive me guys, I read this this morning, Pro Proverbs 20 verse 5 says this, the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. Okay, in other words, there's there's treasure buried deep inside every person and a person of insight or a person of wisdom or a person who's decided to heed the words of Jesus at the end of the Good Samaritan and go and do likewise does what it takes to go beyond the surface and actually draw out the goodness in people. We haven't got time to go into much more than that. I just want you to catch that Jesus said to the disciples one day, if you go out a little bit further and put the net a little bit deeper, there's a fresh catch. They were fishermen and they'd been fishing all night and caught nothing, but Jesus knew there was a catch. They just had to go a little bit deeper. 
So in the context of our relationships, in crossing over the road, in trying to help people, and reach people and build with people, not only do we need to create space, we also need to be the kind of people that say, you know what, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper. Now that is vulnerable, it is risky, and we talked about that last week, but we just need to be the kind of people that go beyond the surface. Catherine. Amazing. The next step is don't be the solution. <clears throat> it doesn't help people to be the hero. You know, for, in, for us to um, ride in on our white horse with our shiny arm, shine, hang on, hang on. Yes, with our shiny cape on. Um, and you know, I'm here to help you and we're gonna fix this situation. We're gonna fix this problem. It doesn't help for me or you to be the hero in somebody else's situation. In fact, um, that can be um, really difficult for people and disempowering for them. Equally, let's not disqualify ourselves of, well, I am not a parent, so I couldn't help them, or I'm not married, so I'm not sure what you're going through. But let's start with this. Let's start with asking the Holy Spirit for wisdom and inviting Jesus into the middle of the situation. Let's not be the solution. Somebody recently said this, um, Jesus will go wherever he is invited. Let's pull up the chair, metaphorically speaking, when we're with someone and say, what is Jesus saying here? Let's cut through some of the chaos of the situation, of what's going on. What is God saying? What has he already said? And what is he doing in this situation? He is at work. Let's be encouraging in and through the situation. You know, we know that God is at work in all things and that he can work all things together for the good of those who love him. Let's be encouraging and building each other's faith and point people to Jesus. Ask what he is saying. Cut through the chaos of the situation, even when we have the best intentions. Let's not be the solution, but point people to Jesus. Brilliant. All right, so we're gonna create space, we're gonna go beyond the surface, and we're gonna recognize that we are not the solution, Jesus is. That's very reassuring to me because it means that I don't have to be a trained counselor, I don't have to be a professional therapist, I don't have to understand the, the sort of science or pain even of addiction, I don't have to do all that. But what I can do is have faith. And this is the, another step, is that when you are struggling or your life is maybe, um, you know, full of disappointment or whatever the situation is, and your faith seems to be overdrawn. You ever been to the cash machine and realized that sinking feeling? that there isn't any money in the account. In fact, you're overdrawn. That's an awful feeling, but sometimes we can be overdrawn in our faith in that we just kind of ran out or it's kind of leaked out somehow by our circumstances. But what God is challenging us to do is not to be a professional. Now we need professionals, you know, in the story, I think Dad's gonna talk about this next actually, so I'll leave that. But um, we don't have to be professionals, but what we can do is have faith for someone. We were at an all-time low a few years ago when, um, and some of you know the story, we were trying to renovate our house and we ended up getting ripped off and then we got broken and the cars got nicked and, and it was a Sunday morning and it was the first Sunday morning in like, I don't know, like felt like a thousand years where we couldn't go to church because the cars had been stolen and we both sat on the bed and we were just at an all-time low with our faith but then somebody who we hadn't seen for 10 years got a message to us and said, hey, I've got a word from God for you. And what was happening in that scenario, even though we were overdrawn in the faith department, someone, an old friend, was putting a faith deposit into us. 
She shared a verse of scripture with us, which we don't have the time to go into. But as we sat on the bed and read these verses from Isaiah, our faith started to lift all of a sudden. It was like a catalyst. Faith in her led to a faith injection in us. So listen, don't worry about being a professional therapist. Don't worry about being someone who knows all the answers because all we have to do is point people to Jesus, but also be a person of faith. Make sure that you have got the Word of God in your heart and in your mouth so that you can say, hey, I'm going to bring some faith to this situation. Create space. Go beyond the surface. Don't be the solution, but have faith. Thank you, Pastor Darren. Next step is know your limits. And I love that this is included uh, in the Scripture, that Jesus, uh, this parable that Jesus is telling us that um, the, the, the Samaritan takes him to the, the inn and he looks after him, but then it comes a point where he has to hand him over. He gets to his limit and he says to the innkeeper, you, you take over now and you look after him. And in the journey that we're on with friends in, in relationship and with people that we walk over the road to, there comes a point where we have to let go and say to the professionals, you look after him, you look after them, you take over now. And um, in Psalm 119, verse 96, in the Good News Translation, it says this, David writes this, King David says this, I have learned that everything has limits, but your commandment is perfect. This is King David who wrote most of the Psalms, unified the tribes of Israel, made Jerusalem the capital of the Israeli nation. He, he's considered to be Israel's greatest king, a giant killer and a man after God's own heart, whose reign ushered in the period in which the first temple was built. But he knew, I've got my limits. He didn't build the temple, but he prepared the way for his son to build the temple. And we have to understand in, in our journey with people that we have our limits and we don't have to be the hero. We don't have to be the solution that what we can do is we point people to Jesus, but we also know that there's professionals out there, people who are skilled and qualified, who can take over, who can bring that healing, that restoration to the point we, we can come back. We can still be the friend. We can still be the one who, who is walking beside, praying with them as they get counseling, as they get debt advice, as they get marriage counseling, as they get, as they get, as they get. But we have to understand and we have to know our limits. Not for our sake, but for their sake. That we don't want to be those that they are dependent upon, but we need to get to that point, as I keep saying, for their sake, where we hand over and say, you look after them. You look after them. So the, the steps that, that we've got, we've got the, the steps that we're looking at that um, create space, go beyond the surface, don't be the solution, have faith for, know your limits. And the final step is take time. Take your time. Friendships, relationships, every friendship and relationship that I've got has taken time for, for me to build. Some that are at the starting stages right now, others that have been going on for 20, 30 years that I've put time and effort and love into. Time needs love. I love the scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it doesn't dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. We have gotta put love into our relationships, but love takes time. Being patient, being kind, filling it with, with goodness, not keeping a record of wrong. It all takes time, and in it, it takes effort. It's like digging a well, and we see this in Genesis 26, where Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days. It's, it's digging, digging wells to get to the resource, to get to the brilliance of what a relationship can be. I've never dug a well. Anybody ever dug a well? I have dug fence poles for a new fence panel. I have done that. And it was hard work. And I'm digging down with my spade and I'm coming across rubbish. I'm coming across rubble. I'm coming across the things that the builders have left that I'm pulling out and thinking, what on earth is this? And I'm getting my hands in there and I'm cutting my hands. It's blood, sweat and tears to get down so this fence panel comes in. That's what relationships, we're sometimes digging things out. We're sometimes addressing problems. It all takes time and we're getting our hands in. We're getting dirty. We're, we're taking time. We're, we're, we're taking them moments 
to build great relationships. It takes time. But then the fence panel goes in. We put the concrete in there and, and I step back and I look at, at the work that I've put in and it's standing strong. It sets, it, it gets in its place and I put the fence panel in and the fence is there and I'm looking at this that I put blood, sweat and tears into it and it's, it's standing strong, it's standing firm and it stands against things. I give it a kick, the boys kick the football at it, the, the, the storm comes and it stands. If we want relationships that stand the test of time, we've got to put the effort in and that's what we do. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray in a moment. We're going to pray. And we're going to pray that, almost like a prayer of commitment, that we will be a church that takes the initiative, crosses over the road, and actually starts to walk with people. And I just know that we're going to hear testimonies. That's like a Bible word for the story of, right? We're going to hear stories of people in our church be it, on, be it on New Year's Eve. Remember New Year's Eve last year? It was absolutely crazy. There's gonna be people in our church on New Year's Eve and their story is gonna involve someone in this room who crossed over. Someone who said, hey, how are you doing? Let me talk to you about this or let, tell me about your family or whatever it might be. And we actually started a journey with people that ended with or, or maybe took them to the start of their journey of the transformational work of Jesus Christ. Zoe touched on it already when she was talking about our friends in Rwanda. We kind of, she used that illustration because of our church, our church friends there, and we've just come back from mission there. But it highlights to me that in Western society, we actually wait to be invited. It's kind of part of our sort of way of thinking that we wait to be invited. And the reason why we've got a chimney and some garden chairs on the platform this morning is because I wanted to show you that all you need to start this journey with the person is a back garden. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, I don't have one. I live in an apartment, which is an American word for a flat. But I could equally, as well as a chimney, I could put up on here a great big toaster or a kettle, yeah. or a block of cheese and a loaf of bread. Yeah. Because actually, we have what it takes to be people of initiative yeah. that are not waiting to be invited. We're not being rude and kicking people's doors in, going, I'm having tea at yours. That's why this represents your garden, not theirs. Don't be lifting up Daz's fence panel and crawling <laughs> under. But actually, if you've got a garden, or you've got a toaster, or you've got a spare five minutes in your calendar, yeah. and you can say, you know what, God, show me who to use that yeah. resource for. Yeah. And that's how we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray that we will be people of initiative. Yeah. Before we do that, and this is a bit of an unusual way to sort of land a message, which has in itself been unusual anyway, you know, at this point in the service, we might do a worship song or we might pray for people and we are going to pray. Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We'd love for you to join us at one of our campuses, Manchester, Chester or online every Sunday, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. 